how it came to my knowledge that we were actually um, on Monday is one of my sisters sent me a message just simply saying, but tonight is Monday. Uh, today is Monday. And I'm like, what? So um, my spirit was already geared up um, since yesterday to teach. So I, you know, my, my mind was ahead of the day that I sent out the link um, yesterday, thinking it was Tuesday. So I'm thankful unto the Lord that he has spared my life to see this another Tuesday. The days and weeks are flying by so quickly. And sometimes because of all the different things that are happening, if we're not careful, we lose track of time. But I want to welcome everyone. Now is a good time to send out the link and you know invite somebody to amen, swing by and give their ears to the word of the Lord. Amen. Um, I spent about two hours this evening. Me and my father was reasoning in the word of the Lord on the phone. Um, and when I, when we, you know, decided that all right, and I have to go now. When I look at the time, two hours already passed, and we were just talking about the things of the Lord and the word of the Lord. And so I thank God for my earthly father. And, um, you know, also all my brethren that from time to time, when we do connect on the phone, we are talking about the things of God and we're not indulging in foolish talk and vain babblings. Amen. And the Bible teaches us that there is a record being kept, a record of remembrance, a book of remembrance. Amen. Is being kept of those who oftentimes talk in the name of the Lord. So, you know, it is a good thing to, amen, talk in the things of the Lord as Bridget. Um, you know, not to be indulging in vain babblings. That's what we did when we were in the world. Amen. But now that we are in Christ, amen, there's a lot for us to talk about and to learn, amen, about the things of the Lord. So, I am delighted to be here tonight. I'm going to share my screen and uh, we're going to continue in the subject matter uh, that we have been, um, that we have initiated last week, um, looking at the journey um, from Egypt to the promised land. And um, I believe there will be a lot to, amen, to take in. I'm sure, you know, a lot of the scriptures and some of the things that we will cover will be no new thing or, you know, but I believe there is always something edifying to come forth from the presence of the Lord when we talk in his word. There is always something to be revealed or something to get a better understanding of. There is no new thing under the sun. It may be new to us, but amen. Any revelation that we receive today in our time, amen. This was knowledge that the men of old had, the apostles had. This is not these knowledge, it's just that you know, we amen have to receive it, amen, by the spirit to come to the right understanding of the scriptures, amen. So, we're going to look at the journey from Egypt to the promised land. And we're going to pick up from where we left off last week. Um, we looked at last week, you know, how, how Israel got into Egypt. Yes, we spent some time looking at how they came to become residents of Egypt. And uh, we acknowledge that God gave them favor. Uh, for a season in Egypt till they were given permission and commanded by Pharaoh that they could occupy the best land in Egypt. So they were treated with royalty in Egypt for a season. And this was because of God's favor unto his people, making provision for them 
for a time of famine that would have come upon the earth and the Lord ensured that his people were well provided for, well taken off. He did an invasion of Egypt at the highest level, but the Egyptians didn't see it as an, inv as an in invasion for a time. Amen. You know, for a season, Israel enjoyed good relations with the Egyptians and the Pharaoh of the day. But there came a time when that changed. So we're going to pick up, amen, from the book of Genesis chapter 47. And uh, we're going to read from verse 27. Get some more details of this journey. The Bible says, And Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions therein, and grew and multiplied exceedingly. So the land of Egypt didn't belong to uh, Israel, but the Lord made them residents there for a very long time. And they grew and they multiplied and they owned stuff. So they were progressive, they were progressive people in the land. They weren't a burden to the economy of Egypt. They were a blessed people, a favored people among the Egyptians. The scripture said at verse 28, And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the whole age of Jacob was 147 years. So if Jacob whole age, meaning he lived to see 147 years, it means that Jacob lived 130 years outside of Egypt. And at the point of Joseph sending his brethren to bring their father to him in Egypt, from that point, Jacob would have lived in Egypt a hundred, sorry, 17 years. So his total life on the earth was divided uh, 130 years outside of Egypt and 17 years in the land of Egypt as a guests, guest of Pharaoh. The Bible teaches, and this is going to be important as we look into some more of the details, so keep that in mind. The Bible teaches, and the time drew nigh that Israel must die, and he called his son Joseph, and said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and deal kindly and truly with me, Bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt. So although Jacob lived 17 years in Egypt, Jacob knew this was not the land of his rest. And so he did not want to be buried in the land of Egypt. You know, these patriarchs, they had a certain uh, understanding and mindset that, you know, when the Lord had made them that promise that he would you know, bring them into a land, give them a certain land, even though in their lifespan they were not able to witness it while being alive upon the earth, but they were so convinced and persuaded and believed God that the day would come that the Lord would fulfill the promise to bring them into that land, that these men didn't want to be buried in a strange land. And Egypt to them was such a land, a strange land. So although they had favor and comfort there, at the time when he was to die, he made a request of his sons that they should not bury him in Egypt. And the scripture said at verse 30, But I will lie with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt. 
And this was also symbolic that Israel was not supposed to be comfortable or become so comfortable in Egypt to the degree that they were not looking forward to go out so that they could get into the promised land that the Lord had in store for them. And even so, we today, children of God, regardless of what success and prosperity you and I may enjoy in this life and this earth in its current state, never allow yourself to become complacent in your spiritual life and in your focus that you forget that we're on a pilgrim and we're just passing through this life and we're supposed to be looking for that city that the Lord is preparing for his people. Are you hearing this? Don't allow yourself to become so comfortable in the world you know, focusing on acquiring this and acquiring that, storing up wealth, and at the expense of losing your bearings and your focus that, listen, this earth is temporal, this life is temporal, and Jesus said, where your treasure is, there is also your heart. So if you're storing up treasures in this earth so much, that you lose focus that God is going to burn up this earth in time to come. Amen. And these things, these, no matter how much wealth you may accomplish earthly, but the, uh, that you should not forget that the most important thing that you could ever possess is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So when you look at the the way that the patriarchs conducted themselves, it was sending a message and a signal to Israel. Listen, don't get comfortable in a strange land because there is a land of promise that we are to be looking for, which the Lord has ordained for us to occupy and come to. Are you hearing? So Jacob didn't even want it, wanted to be buried in Egypt, even though the last 17 years of his life was spent in Egypt with comforts, as being treated as royalty among the Egyptians. You understand? And so the scripture said, but I will lie with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. And he said, I will do as thou hast said. So Joseph promised to do as his father Jacob had requested. And he said, swear unto me. And he swore unto him. And Israel bowed himself upon the bed's head. You understand? And when you travel to chapter 48 and verse 21, the scripture said, and Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die, but God shall be with you. You see the kind of relationship the patriarchs had with God? They knew when their time of departing this life was come, and they had adequate time to have prepared even their offspring and their grandchildren uh, and give them a prophetic word from God that they could uh, hold fast to and be guided by and I believe the Lord is open to have that kind of relationship with his people amen I, I don't see it as something that the Lord amen you know just take pleasure in hiding from his people I believe God can make us know make us fully aware when our time of departure has come he has done it for the patriarch even moses knew his time of departure um uh, aaron knew his time of departure jesus knew when his time of departure had come i'm not saying that the lord will reveal to you know all of us but i believe it is, if it is something that you desire and you walk in fellowship with god 
I don't see it as a big deal for God to say, son, you know, your time of departing this life has come. So get your house in order, you know, put things in place. Amen. One, one king was told to get his house in order because the Lord was going to take him. And of course, he beseeched the Lord. And then the Lord sent another word to him. Say, I'm going to extend you by 15 days or 15 years. And so these men of old had a certain fellowship, amen, and a relationship with God that even their time of death didn't come upon them as a surprise. And they weren't fearful about it, amen. They looked forward to it and they were able to leave words, amen, of um, prophecy and encouragement unto their offspring and so the scripture said and Israel said unto Joseph behold I die but God shall be with you you hear this word that he's leaving before his departure God shall be with you amen and even Jesus before he departed this earth he left a word of assurance with the church many words of assurance and we have to hold fast to these words even if we don't see it fulfilled in our lifetime, we must leave knowing that the words of our Lord are sure. Amen. And so Joseph was told, God shall be with you and bring you again unto the land of your fathers. So Jacob was also positioning the mindset of Joseph. Don't be settled in Egypt as though Egypt is a final place amen of abode but you are to be looking forward to come out of Egypt and to come to the place of your fathers that which the Lord had promised this was the departing word that Jacob left with his sons you understand the scripture said moreover I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. And so these were the departing words of brother Jacob, amen, unto Joseph, amen, unto his sons. And if you read, I believe in chapter eight, there were different blessings that uh, Jacob pronounced upon each of his sons and different things, some of it prophetic that he had declared, amen, unto each of his sons. And, you know, not in this study, I didn't want to, you know, go into that part in this study, but, you know, we can look at some of those things that he had declared, even especially concerning Judah, amen. Uh, uh, there are some prophetic things that have been declared and uh, they are relevant in these last days. And so we're going to continue in chapter 49. The Bible teaches, And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together. So it is in chapter 49 uh, that Jacob declared the blessings. And not 48, chapter 49, Jacob gathered his sons. And he said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days very important so jacob was able to declare to his sons that which would befall them in the last days wow he said at verse 2 gather yourselves together and hear ye sons of jacob and hearken unto israel your father all right, and so when I read the other verses going down, you'd see the different things that he declared to each son and concerning each son. And at verse 33, after Jacob would have finished, you know, declaring the blessings, pronouncing blessings and declaring some prophetic things that will come upon his sons in the latter times, the Bible said at verse 33, and when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into the bed and yielded up the ghost and was gathered unto his people. And so these men 
when their time of departure came, they were not sad. Amen. They didn't have a pity party with their children. They had instruction from the Lord that they were able to impart unto their children. They were able to speak prophetically by the will of God. Amen. That their sons would have words to guide them. Amen. Throughout their journey as they continued in their journey. Because there was a promise that the Lord had given unto the forefathers. And those who were departing died believing. Even though they didn't witness it with their eyes. They believed that God was going to keep his promise. That he made to them. And fulfill it. Amen. In the life of their children or grandchildren. And so that is very profound. And when we go to chapter 50 of Genesis, you're going to see Joseph who spent many, many years in Egypt. Even Joseph had the same mindset because that would have been passed on to him from his father. Let's read. The Bible said in verse 22 of Genesis 50, and Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house. And Joseph lived an hundred and ten years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation. And the children also of Mekur, the son of Manasseh, were brought up upon Joseph's knees. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die. And God will surely visit you. Sounds familiar? So Joseph knew that his time of departure was also come. You see the relationship these men had with the Lord? I believe, I believe we can have such a fellowship and relationship with the Lord. I believe so. The Bible said, because remember this, that is not a terror. To the blood washed ones you know amen that is not a terror to god's people to those who are born again filled with god's spirit walking in obedience amen in obedience to the word of the lord bible teaches precious in the eyes of uh in the sight of the lord is the death of the saints the apostle paul said to be absent from this body is to be present with the lord amen and so joseph said um i die let me find back the verse i die and god will surely visit you so he's speaking with the same confidence that his father departed with and left with them a word he said god will surely visit you and bring you out of this land Unto the land which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and he shall carry up my bones from hence. So Joseph did not want his bones to remain in Egypt. This was also symbolic that this don't become too comfortable in Egypt. This is not the place of rest. This is not the promise of the Lord. You're here for a season and you should be looking forward to head out at some point in time. The Bible said, so Joseph died being 110 years old and they embalmed him and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. So watch this. Joseph was, uh, his burial was of that which they are accustomed to in Egypt. Joseph, a man, was one of the rulers except uh, beside Pharaoh of Egypt. Amen. He was next to Pharaoh in Egypt. And so his burial was not ordinary. 
the Egyptians respected Joseph. Pharaoh's house definitely respected Joseph and favored him. And so Joseph was treated as royalty. And he was embalmed. If you know anything about the Egyptian history, uh, they normally embalmed their pharaohs and they buried them in some huge um, you know, kind of housing for the dead. And you can see a lot of this stuff in you know documentaries where they discover you know different uh fears, etc. And so Joseph had the same mind and wanted to leave the same word and the same focus in the mind of his brethren that were remaining. Don't get too comfortable in egypt egypt is not your place of rest and god's people cannot afford to get too comfortable in this world in this wicked world don't become desensitized to the wicked ways of the world that you're no longer troubled amen are stirred in spirit against the ways of the world we are to be looking to head out of the world. But some of us are looking to leave legacy. Huh? And not legacy by God, but our own legacy. Storing up treasures. Not in heaven, but in earthly possession. Not saying that you're not to strive to accomplish and achieve. That's not the message. But not at the expense of you and I becoming consumed with the ways of the world when you read revelation 18 what was the message to god's people the message was come out of her my people that he be not partakers of her sins and that he receive not of her plagues revelation 18 verse 4 there's a cry that is being made amen to god's people come out of her Amen. Don't embed yourself in her. Get out of her. Get the ways of the world out of you and come out of the way of the world. This is not our place of rest. This earth in its state now is not the place of rest. This is not the rest. Amen. It's not having a big house and a hill. That's not the rest. You may have that, but make sure you have the rest in you. Amen. You may have millions in the bank, but make sure you have the rest in you. You may have the, your dream job and your dream business, but make sure you have treasures stored up in heaven. And so Joseph, in essence, left the same message in the minds of his brethren. Amen. He told his brethren that they must carry up his bones out of Egypt. So even though Joseph would have been buried in Egypt, he was embalmed and put in a coffin in Egypt. His brethren knew that at an appointed time, when they were to leave Egypt, they couldn't leave Joseph's bones in egypt amen i will get to that later on i couldn't leave his bones in egypt amen he, 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 joseph made a request to remember to take out his bones out of egypt in other words brethren don't get settled amen too comfortable in this place he might be living like royalty fine he might be living comfortable have a lot of ox and goat and sheep and all that good stuff. But remember, this is not the place of rest. This is not the promised land. And so Israel enjoyed favor and much comfort and blessings in Egypt. And this let us know that God can bless us in a strange land. God can allow us as his people to have comfort in this present world, this present evil world, 
God is able to still give his people favor. Amen. In any condition upon the earth. Even if there's famine, wars and rumors of war, God have ways and provision to give favor unto his people. Many people seek the king's favor, but the scripture teaches that every man's judgment is from the Lord. Let me read that I believe in Proverbs 30. Amen. Uh, Proverbs 29 verse 26. The Bible said many, many seek the ruler's favor, but every man's judgment cometh from the Lord. So God is able. He's the one that promotes and he's the one that demotes. So he's able to provide for his people under any condition. There was a prophet that was in the wilderness. God used a crow to feed him. Are you hearing? God used a bird to feed the prophet. And if God gave the prophet food, you know the prophet get good food. Amen. Because God don't give bad gifts. Amen. So the prophet got the best of food. Can you imagine? God used a raven to feed the prophet. And so God is well able, even in these last days, to open doors for his people. Amen. Grant favor to his people. Position his people in strategic places. For when times of difficulty will come, as he did strategically position Joseph in Egypt. But the journey of Joseph getting into the palace was not easy. It was not comforts right through. There were lots of discomforts. He was lied on. Amen. Thrown in prison. Thrown in a pit. But then he was trusted. He was raised up. Made a ruler. You understand? And so God. Amen. He has. He, he has a way always. For his people. The question is. Are we trusting him? Are we looking to him? And Egypt is a type of the world. Are you hearing? Egypt is a type of the world. We're in the world, but we are not of this world. So Israel was supposed to be in Egypt. God permitted them to go down in Egypt for a season. But they were not to adopt the ways of the Egyptian. So they were supposed to be in Egypt for whatever season or time. The Lord would have them there to be. But they were to maintain their identity. They were not to lose focus of the promise of God unto them and where the Lord had promised to bring them. And they were to live with that looking forward to, that longing for, that expectation that the time will come for them to leave Egypt and get to the promised land. Amen. And so in Exodus chapter 1, we're going to see where some changes were going to occur. You saw how great God is? While Joseph was alive, the favor that was upon Joseph continued to benefit his brethren. But the Bible teaches in Exodus chapter 1, reading from verse 8, now there arose up a new king over Egypt. So what's going on here? Joseph come up, come off the scene. A new king come on the scene. So that the Pharaoh that favored Joseph and his brethren, he was now off the scene. Joseph also was off the scene. A new era of time was being ushered in. And so there arose a new king in Egypt, which knew not Joseph. This must have been many times would have passed. And this new king of Pharaoh, uh, king of Egypt, is raised up. 
that he didn't even know Joseph. He didn't have any record of Joseph, no memory of Joseph. The Bible said, and he said unto his people, so this new Pharaoh now, he's going to govern different. He said unto his people, behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Amen. Did you know that God's people, even though we may not be more numerically, but we are mightier than the forces and the powers in the world? Amen. Did you know the church of Jesus Christ, though we may not be numeric numerically more than the world in numbers, but we are mightier and have more power than the power of the world. The Bible teaches greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And we must remember that. Amen. God has equipped us with power that your government don't have. Amen. They don't have power to cast out devils except, amen, they are of God. Amen. They don't have power to bind things in the earth and it be bound in heaven. But we have that power. The church of Jesus Christ have that power. They don't have power to command demons to leave folks and don't return. But God put that power in the church. Amen. So we see Israel was seen in the eyes of the Egyptians and the Egyptian king as more and mightier than they. How do we see ourselves in the earth as children of God? Don't you know that the earth is waiting for the sons of God to manifest? And there came, it's strange enough, Look how Egypt saw Israel. But the same Israel, and I'm jumping the gun. When time came for them to go and occupy the promised land, some men brought back some evil report. And now was saying that they be as grass upper in the eyes of the men down in the promised land. Never you look at yourself, amen, from the perspective of the enemy. Let the enemy say what they want to say. But you must always see yourself through the eyes of God's word concerning us. Are you hearing this? Speak God's word. God's promises that you have declared concerning us. Don't speak the language of the world. And so, interestingly, the Egypt, the new king of Egypt, see the numbers of the children of Israel more and mightier than they were. Verse 10 said, he said this, come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it came and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us. And so get them up out of the land. Why is it that the Egyptian king couldn't think the, the, the other direction in that seeing that these Hebrew people have been among us for years, have been treated well by the previous pharaoh, why couldn't think that perhaps if any should invade Egypt, Israel would come to Egypt's defense, noting that they had good relations with the previous Pharaoh. Why didn't he see it from that perspective versus the perspective of Israel joining with their enemies instead to overthrow them? Because the time was come that Israel should be looking to come out of Egypt. Listen, God knows how we are. 
when we become comfortable for a long period of time, we tend to not like change. Amen. We tend to resist change. And sometimes we're able not to see what is before us because we have been so comfortable in this one direction that you no longer, amen, want any change. You want it to remain the same way because, you know, I'm familiar with this um, this way. I'm used to this way and I'm not going to change it. So what God does bring discomfort to uproot us out of our routines. I believe in the book of Revelation and this is throughout the history, biblical history. God's people, anytime they find themselves, amen, in long periods of comfort, they tend to lose focus. And in such cases, God used enemies to awake us back to sobriety. And in the book of Revelation, the Lord speaks, amen, concerning those who say that they are rich and they increase with goods. Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. The Lord said, because thou sayest, I am rich. And increase with goods. And have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched. And miserable and poor and blind and naked. And the Lord's perspective was this. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. That thou mayest be rich. And white raiment that thou mayest be clothed. And that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. So the Lord's perspective was different from how, amen, they saw themselves. And so the Lord have a way of, amen, stirring up, stirring up discomfort. Not for our destruction. It's not because the Lord don't want to see you happy. No. The Lord wants it to bring you to a higher place. And if we remain in our comfort, we will be stuck. No progress. And will become spiritually dormant and stagnant. No spiritual growth. And it is God's will that we build upon our most holy faith. We are supposed to be growing from faith to faith. This is why leading up to the coming of Jesus Christ, the church will be under pressure. Are you hearing this? I know they don't preach this in church, but I'm telling you, leading up as we come to the approaching and the soon return of Jesus Christ, God is going to allow the church to come under pressure, not to destroy us, but to prepare us to leave out of this earth. Are you hearing this? In order for Israel to leave Egypt, Israel have to come under pressure. Israel had to come to a place where they despise Egypt. Some of us are in a place where we still love the world. And the scripture says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Are you hearing this? If we are lovers of the world, the love of the Father is not in us. Look at the wickedness in this world. Look at the atrocities that is happening. How can we love this world? Amen. Look at the things that we suffer. The righteous man, the world was not designed to favor the righteous man. The system of the world was designed to try to frustrate the righteous man, the godly man. And had it, had it not been for the hand of God, it would have been worse. But because God rules in the affairs of men, and it is he who promotes, God knows how to make ways for his people, even when there is opposition. And so as the church draw closer, 
to its to her departure out of this earth god is going to allow pressure to come to stir us and to push us out of the ways of the world push us on our knees push us in fasting and prayer push us to win the loss and so any of you who have been taught that you know you ain't going to see nothing well if you live long enough watch and see god can't lie amen god can't lie the pattern is there the bible teaches in the time of noah what happened in the time of noah the bible said the hearts and the thoughts of men were evil continually but God had made a way for Noah to escape the judgment that he will bring. But in the midst, prior to that, Noah had to live among people that their whose, whose imagination and thoughts were evil continually. But yet Noah found grace in the eyes of God. He was not overtaken by the evil because he found grace in the eyes of God. But wickedness had increased in the time of Noah. Look at what transpired when Lot was to leave Sodom. What did the men do? They surrounded Lot's house and demanded that Lot let out the two men, which were angels, that came in his house. And when Lot offered up his virgin daughters, the men of Sodom took it as an insult to them. And they threaten Lot that, listen, you better be careful, mind. We have to deal worse with you than that which we had planned for those two men. So they were threatening Lot with sodomy. Because Lot dared to refuse to allow them to access the precious things in his house. And I've taught this before. The enemy wants the precious things in your house. And you know, we are God's house. We are God's temple. Amen. There was a king that displayed all the treasures of the, of the Lord's house unto, amen, the enemy. And what did the enemy do? <laughs> Come and take them. So the enemy always have his eyes on God's precious jewels in the earth which are God's people. Israel called the apple of his eyes. Well, what do you think about the church? God's bride. And so, Lot, before he departed Sodom, he was under pressure from the Sodomites and the others. They surrounded his house and they were pressing against the doors of his house, wanting the men that was in his house. The scripture teaches as it was in the day of Lot, as it was in the day of Noah, so shall it be at the time of the coming of the Son of Man. Lot was under pressure. His house was encircled by men who were burning in their lust, wanting to defile the two angels. And even though the angels had to pull that in the house, having smote the men of Sodom and Gomorrah with blindness, that didn't stop them from pressing. They were still trying to press the way in, and they were now blinded see what wicked spirit was up upon them blindness never stopped them from still trying to break into Lot's house and so it came to a point that the angels literally had to hold Lot by his hand with his children and 
wife to pull them out or else they would have lingered and be consumed Lot's wife looked back you see what's happening and it is written remember Lot's wife that's a serious statement right there we could preach a whole sermon on that remember Lot's wife what is there to remember about Lot's wife she didn't make it out and she was this close huh even though angels were sent help was sent advance warning was sent that she was not ignorant of the impending judgment that was to come and in spite of advance warning and help to get out lot wife looked back and became a pillar of salt remember lot's wife and so the lord our god who love us allow pressure trouble sometimes to come upon his people to shift their mindset in the direction that they are to go the lord knew because of the comforts that israel enjoyed in egypt they would not willingly and voluntarily decide to pack up their stuff with their families and children while they could while they were not held captive they could have leave they could say listen jacob told us that we are to get out of this place our forefathers told us let us pack up and seek the lord and see where he want us you know he's going to get us in that land they wouldn't voluntarily do it so god get involved in the fullness of time this new fear so let us deal wisely with them lest they multiply and it come to pass that when they fall it out anywhere they join also unto our enemies and fight against us and so get them up out of the land therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities python and ramses i wonder if some of these huge pyramids that they say they discover in Egypt that are there today, if these were built by the Hebrews when they were tasked by Pharaoh to build in treasure cities, who knows? The Bible said, but the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew you see what's happening you see what affliction bring growth <laughs> amen this is what affliction trial of your faith tribulation suffering for god's people it's not designed to destroy you it cannot destroy you if you trust god cannot but it will produce growth Amen. It will produce increase in the way God wants us to increase. Are you seeing this? The Bible said, the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were grieved because of the children of Israel. But why are the Egyptian grieves? grieved when they are not the ones being afflicted 
It was the children of Israel that were being afflicted by them. But yet, the Egyptians were grieved. Why? Because what they meant for evil against God's people was not producing the results that they expected. And God's people must have this confidence when we stand upon God's word, it don't matter who wants us dead. It don't matter who don't like us. If God said live, you shall live. Amen. If God said prosper, you shall prosper. If God said increase, don't matter who don't want you to increase. Don't you hear the scripture say, thou preparest a table before my enemies in the presence of my enemies. God prepare a table. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. So what the enemy meant for evil. The snares and the traps that the enemy set up. And think that they are going to destroy God's people. Not so. Not so. So now, Pharaoh, the Egyptians were grieved. Why? The craft against God's people was not producing the results that they desire. Now they were frustrated. No matter who want go to witchcraft work and Obama, don't worry about that. You lean upon the word of God. No matter who, those who don't like you in the workplace, don't, 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 don't curse them. Don't worry about it. Lean on Jesus. Treat them like how God said to treat them. And you'll see the result. God will frustrate their tokens. The snares that they set cannot work. Don't you hear the Lord said, Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's what Jesus said. Cannot lie. And so we see the same pattern in Israel. So they were frustrated. The Egyptians were frustrated. The Bible said in Exodus 1, reading from verse 13 and the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor <laughs> and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field all their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor so they dealt harshly with Israel. The same people that had good favor with the previous Pharaoh and the people of Egypt. A new king rise up. A new devil confront you. What you going to do? You know, you, you had victories over previous devils. Different circumstances and you trusted God. And you see the Lord come through. But then there come a new circumstance. One that you have never faced before. In your life. What are you going to do? Are you going to still trust God? Are you going to still believe him? To give you a victory. And to allow you to endure. Until the end. And so. Israel was now. Under pressure because this new Pharaoh come up with some craft that in his own mind should depopulate and weaken the Hebrews in his land but did it work absolutely not Exodus chapter 1 reading from verse 15 and the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives. So now fear I get desperate and try to work them to death. And instead of them falling dead, they're increasing, they're multiplying. So now fear I get extreme. 
because he wants to reduce the population of the Hebrews. The population agenda is nothing new. It has been going on for a long time. Satan has always wanted to kill out God's people from out of the earth. So he can reign without hindrance, without obstruction. But God will not have it so. He will never leave himself without a witness. The Bible said, And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Shephara, and the name of the other poor. And he said, When he do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then he shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then shall she live. So Pharaoh come up with a plan to target the male child, the man child of the Hebrews. There's a reason why Satan always target the male child. When God made his covenants, he made it through the men, the man's seed. Because even if that man die, as long as that man have a seed, a son, a male child, it continues. You understand? When a man die without a male child, his name is his, his name come to an end practically it was as if he was never born <clears throat> because there is no male child to carry on his seed his name and the strength of a nation whether or not you believe it is in its men are you hearing this? The strength of an army is in its men. The strength of a society, it is, it is in its men. And the weakness of a society is in its men. If its men are weak and out of place, you have a weak society. That's why no army go to war. With women at the front line, all women at the front line. They might nowadays they're trying to say an equality. And so they are trying to integrate women in the army. But how many women would volunteer to go down in Ukraine and withstand barrage? Amen. Of different kind of weaponry. Huh? How many? Not many. Amen. Not many, but men. Amen. They would. You have some men that live for war. They're eager to go to battle. That's how men were designed. So the strength of a nation is in its male population. So if you have a nation full of drunks, <laughs> if you have a nation full of drunken men, men who are not sober, that's a weak society. If you have a nation full of criminals, men, men who are in, indulging this gang and this criminal activity, your nation is in a bad state. Strength of a nation is in its men. So Pharaoh had good sense, but it didn't work for him. Decided that he wanted to kill out the male child. And so the Bible teaches that he commanded them when he do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools if it be a son then he shall kill him but if it be a daughter then she shall live if there's going to be an uprising in any nation that is going to be successful you better have the men them at the front or you cannot produce a successful uprising with just women but you can produce a successful uprising with just men 
that's reality we know we're in a world where satan have deceived the whole world and trying to paint a different picture equality god made men and women to have different roles and they're designed differently to perform different function in the family in society in the household but satan trying to blur the line that now you can't even tell woman from man and man from woman now you know the society is weak and that's why satan will be able to enslave mankind that's why the beast will be able to rule amen and subdue rich and poor bound and free because the people are already being conditioned for that the societies are being weakened didn't you read in isaiah 14 when the question was asked is this the man that weakened the nations huh that's what the scripture said is this the man that weakened the nation satan weakened the nations that's what he does by attacking the family structure and the order of god in the earth in the family in the churches it's a satanic movement it's an antichrist spirit that is leading it and driving it to weaken the nations when you, when you destroy the order of God and the structure of the family and the order in the church, you weaken the society and Satan is able to navigate and do as he, he please, except it be when the Lord, you know, restrict him, restrain him. The Bible said, verse 17, but the midwives feared God we're going to look at how women that fear God conduct themselves when they are asked of men to do something contrary to the will of God so the midwives were asked to kill the men the male child kill the sons of the Hebrew but the Bible said the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them. This is how women who fear God operate. When any man is trying to instruct you, contrary to God's word and God's will, don't do it. Are you hearing this? When any man, regardless, whether king, prophet, apostle, bishop, any man who is instructing, instructing you to go contrary to the word of God, if you be a woman that fear God, you will not do it. Likewise, if any man instruct any man, to do something contrary to God's word. If you truly fear God, you will not do it. You'll ignore their titles and look at what God has said and say, let God be true and every man a liar. The Bible said, but the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men, children alive. Women of God, women of God, this is what you should be doing. Save the men. Save the men. Don't, don't join up with no man to kill men of God. Don't join up with no man to put men of God out of their rightful place and usurp authority over the man in the churches. Yeah. Are you hearing this? If you fear God, you do like the midwives. Don't do anything that is contrary 
to God's word. Who did the king of Egypt target? The men, Satan, are doing the same thing in the church and in doing the same thing in the world. Who full up the prisons? Men. Men now want to be women. Men now who pretend to be women want to compete in sports against real women. You know, see the society gone crazy. Who the enemy is targeting? The men. If you get the men, you get the whole family. You get the whole house. So Satan target men in the family, in the world. In the churches, where are the men? They're in gangs, in prison, in wars, dying for nothing. Out of their rightful place, which should be in the Lord, doing God's will at the forefront, instead of taking a back seat. And I want to say to the midwives among us, save the men alive. Don't join in with the Antichrist spirit. To kill the men. Are you hearing this? Do not join in. Any agreement. With the antichrist spirit. Which is against God's order. To kill men. Help pray for the men. That they come to their rightful place. Encourage the men. Brother what are you doing man? No man you are supposed to be at the forefront. Leading the charge. Huh? Against the kingdom of darkness. Proclaiming God's word. The Bible said. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives. And said unto them. Why have he done this thing? And have saved the men children alive. Yes let them ask you. Why you're not usurping authority over the man. Why you're not going to agree. With what they're telling you. You can be a bishop. And you can be this. And you can, you know, don't, don't agree with them. Go back to the word. Go back to the word. Don't you think these women knew that they would be in trouble with Pharaoh for keeping the male child alive? But they feared God more than they fear Pharaoh. Some of us fear men more than God. And so that gets us in trouble with God. But the apostles them say, Judge ye whether it be good to appear men rather than God. The Bible said, and the midwives said unto Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively, they are no weak women, and are delivered her, the midwives come in unto them. So they gave birth quickly. They didn't link, they never languish in pain and labor. Huh? When they traveled to verse 20 of Exodus 1, the scripture said this. Therefore, God dwelt uh, dealt well with the midwives. You see the blessing. Look, look now. The women stand up for God and stood against the word of fear, did not kill the men kept them alive and the bible said god dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and waxed very mightily they grew and god dealt well with the midwives god bless them when you and i stand up on the order the principle of god's word yes you may lose some friends might create a little you know disagreement over there and here but in the end, it's because you took a stand upon God's word, it is going to be a blessing to you. The Bible said it came to pass because the midwives feared God that he made them houses. Look what God do for the midwives. See, see what the fear of the Lord does? When, when we honor God, that brings blessings. And fear a charge all his people saying, every son, so fear I get mad now, every son that is born, he shall cast into the river, and every daughter he shall save alive. 
Listen, if it up to the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of darkness will remove all the men out of the churches. And I guarantee, I tell you this, and remove them out of the leaderships. And you would have chaos. Kingdom of darkness know this. And we can't ignore this. And we'll, show, we'll establish in the word of the Lord. And it's not about gender. It's about order. You understand? It's about God's order in the earth. And the kingdom of darkness. One thing that they must respect is God's word. And when there is a believer that stand upon the word of God, the kingdom of darkness have no authority, no power over that believer at no time. No time at all. Don't you see what Jesus did when the enemy, when he was tempted of the devil in the, in the wilderness? The devil had to back off. And all Jesus used was, it is written. It is written. The devil have respect what's written. He no respect what you make up. They will not respect your feelings and what you think. And, you know, I have a better understanding or a better way. You must respect God's word. That's the sword of the spirit, the word of God. Not your word, my word, our feelings. God's word is what can slay spirits and subdue them through his word and by his name. The Bible said in Exodus chapter 2, and reading from verse 1. And there went a man of the house of Levi and took wife, a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was goodly, a goodly child, she hid him three months. When she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark, an ark of bulrushes. And daub it with slime and with pitch, and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river's bank, brink. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river. And her maidens walked along by the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maids to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him, and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Verse 7, Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child and uh, child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter. And he became her son. And she called his name Moses. And she said, Because I drew him out of water so here it is a child a male child was to be born that god would use to be a deliverer unto each uh, unto israel out of egypt to get them out of egypt there were many women available among the hebrews many of them feared god so there was no shortage of women in that time and women who feared God. But yet, God didn't use a woman to go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. There was no shortage of women. You had, you had Moses' sister, uh, Miriam. He had, he had Miriam, a prophetess. But yet, God never sent her to talk to Pharaoh to tell him let his people go you understand but yet she was a prophetess and she prophesied but she never handled the rod 
Moses was given a rod. Moses was sent to go talk to Pharaoh. Listen, let my people go. And make him know that if him don't let God's people go, what the consequences would be. So here it is. Time passed. The Lord in this timing. Amen. Found him a man. A man, a man child. Amen. And notice there were other male child that were born. But they were not the ones sent to Pharaoh. God had a specific man that he had chosen to send to Pharaoh. And Egypt, uh, Israel had to wait for that man to be born for deliverance to come to them. You understand? And it is God who orchestrates everything. But this child was going to be raised in the house of the same Pharaoh who is dealing wickedly against his people. Look at the greatness of the Lord. Infiltration of Pharaoh's kingdom with a Hebrew child. Right in Pharaoh's house. Right on them nose. Moses was raised in Pharaoh's house and was treated as a son of Pharaoh's daughter. But yet, being raised by his biological mother, what a God, huh? and being fed, breastfed by his biological mother, and Pharaoh's daughter never knew, and Pharaoh never knew. And so Moses would have been taught by his Hebrew mother about the God of Israel. He would have been taught, amen, the ways of the people of God, the custom. But yet he also was exposed to the inner workings of Pharaoh's kingdom and house. This is what we call infiltration. So Moses was like a spy down in Egypt, in Pharaoh's house. God was preparing him, having knowledge of the Hebrew way and having knowledge of the Egyptian ways. But his loyalty was to his God and the people of God, Israel. The Bible said at verse 23 of Exodus 2, and I'm wrapping up. And it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. And they cried and their cry came up unto God. So you see what pressure did? You see what the bondage, the trials did, the suffering did? It pushed them to cry unto the Lord. And their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. This is why the Lord allows some things to come in our life. To push us out of the comfort zone that will make our cry unto the Lord. That the Lord may move us, shift us, and position us to where he wants us to now go. You understand? When we are comfortable, we tend to fall off in our prayer life. We tend to fall off in many things. But when pressure comes, God's people know that they have to look unto the hills from whence cometh their help. The help cometh from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. The Bible said, and God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac. And with Jacob, and God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. In other words, God had mercy for them. God had consideration for them to, del to deliver them out of their condition. And not just out of their condition, but to take them out of Egypt to the promised land. And so God found him a man. 
And so in this message, I also want to encourage the men. Find a place in God. The Bible teaches in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 22, and verse 29. The people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. So there were some evil things going on in the land. Oppression of the poor and the needy. The Lord said, and I sought for a man among them that should make up the edge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. You hear what the Lord said? So God is always looking for a man. Because that is just simply the order. You understand? By one man, sin entered into the world. By one man. The Bible said, and he looked. He sought for a man among them that should make up the edge and stand in the gap. Men, you have to stand in the gap in prayer, in fasting. In the ministry that the Lord has given unto you. And do according to the will of God. And don't be intimidated by the system of the world that wants to weaken men. And beat men back in the background. Satan wants us to just take a back seat so he can wreak havoc in your family. Wreak havoc in your marriage. Wreak havoc in the churches. Don't allow it. God is looking for a man to stand in the gap. Before me for the land that I should not destroy, but I found none. Therefore have I poured up my indignation upon them. See, couldn't find a man, so God poured him indignation. I have consumed them with fire, the fire of my wrath. Their own way have recompense upon their heads, said the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 1. Run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem and see now and know and seek in the broad places thereof if he can find a man, if there be any that executed judgment that seeketh the truth and I will pardon it. Men, you have to come to a rightful place. You have to stand up. Lead your family. Govern your household with the word of God. Don't hide in the back benches in the churches. Huh? Come to the forefront by God's spirit. Be prayed up, fired up to do the work of the Lord. Don't leave it on the women. The Bible said in Isaiah chapter 66, I'm almost there, one more to go. Thus said the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that he built unto me? Where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath mine hand made and all those things have been said the Lord. But to this man will I look. Even to him that is poor. So there's a certain man that the Lord is looking for. A certain heart. To him that is poor. And of a contrite spirit. And tremble it at my word. Men we should love God's word. And fear God. And keep his commandments. Tremble at his word. Respect his word. Stop violate God's word and justify your violation. Look what the midwives, women did that fear God. Fear as a kill the male child. What did the women did? They saved them. These women trembled at God's word. They feared God. What about us men? Why we don't fear God? That we are willing to violate God's word and justify it. Huh? Bible says, but to this man will I look. 
even to him that is poor and have a contrite spirit. What kind of spirit we have, men? Is your spirit contrite? And tremble it at my word. And I close with this. First John 2, verse 12. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven, forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because he have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the father. You know who are little children? Those that obey the word of God. I have written unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you young men because he are strong. And the word of God, this is it. The word of God abided in you young men if you don't have anything to do, you must do this. Make sure God's word abide in you. And he said, and he have overcome the wicked one. When you have a church that is out of the order of God, you cannot overcome the wicked one the way that you should. When men are out of their place, you ain't going to have the victory. Men of God must stand in the gap stand in their position are you not going to have any victory one scripture said i believe in isaiah 9 for this reason the lord shall have no joy in their young men god wants joy out of the young men in the churches the young men in the church is not supposed to be warm in bench isaiah 9 they are reading from verse 16 for the leaders of this people Cause them to err. And they that are led of them are destroyed. Therefore the Lord shall have no joy in their young men. Neither shall have mercy on their fatherless and widows. For everyone is an hypocrite. And an evildoer. And every mouth speaketh folly. For all this is anger is not turned away. But his hand is stretched out still. In other words, God's mercy is still appealing to us. Get in alignment. Young men, I write unto you because ye are strong. And the word of God abideth in you. Every young man in the churches must be spending time in God's word to meditate upon and to live by it. That God can raise you up to be a help and to be a minister and a preacher if God ordained of you to be so. Whatever God would have you to do in the churches. But you shouldn't be sitting warm in bench in church. And to the midwives. Save the young men alive. Save the men alive. Don't, don't, don't help kill the men. Save them alive or else. There is no, there's not going to be any overcoming. The strength of every military is in their men and every society. And there will never be a time where any society have an all-women army and be able to win any victory. Never happen. God bless you. These are the words of the Lord today. Be encouraged. Thank you for giving your ears to the word of the Lord. And uh, we pray that you had, would have been edified and encouraged and inspired to come to a higher place in obedience to the word of the Lord. Thank you, Elder Lambert. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, my brother. Indeed, I can truly say my soul has been richly blessed. Yes, praise the name of the Lord. Part two, amen, has really had given us a little more about the journey 
from Egypt to the promised land. Indeed, and of course, praise God, coming down to the final. Amen. Make sure God's words abide in you. Yes, and also, men, stand in the gap. Praise the name of the Lord. I just hope and trust that each and every one that is on this um, virtual platform, that indeed your soul has been richly blessed. And as our team song rightly said, more about Jesus, let me learn. Amen. I truly hope that you have learned much tonight from the word of God, from the man of God. Amen. Praise God. And just before we close out, if there's anyone with a question, as usual, I give you a chance. You could um, do so now. If not, we will just close out. And may I also remind you that if you have a question, you can also put it in the chat and then we will look at it and uh, um, give you the response. Amen. So, seems like there is no, uh, are you able to unmute your mic? Yes, I think they should be able to unmute, sir. Okay, well, I have not heard, see any hands up or anyone to ask a question. So we just want to give the Lord thanks once again for the man's servant who God had allowed. Praise God. And as he said earlier, that the time is simply going in such a way that he would have wanted to believe that yesterday was Tuesday. Amen. But we give God thanks. Amen. We give God thanks for you, sir. Father in heaven, God, we give you thanks. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your man servant who you had blessed with the word to impart to us, not us of the Gordon Penn Apostolic Church, nor the narrow way Church of Jesus Christ, but Lord God, across the universe, for these words have been reaching out to others by the way of the Facebook and the YouTube. And so we want to thank you, God, for the way in which you have been using your man's servant. And we thank you for each and every one, Lord, who took the time out each Tuesday night, Lord, to, you know, be a participant in this Bible study. Those that are on the um, Facebook Live and those that are on the Zoom platform and for those that will be tuning in on the YouTube as soon as it is being posted. Lord, I just ask of you that you will continue to give you the, 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 mind of the mind of your people that they will have that zeal to feast upon your word. Oh God, and so right now as we're about to close off, that you will dismiss us with your blessing as we say thanks in Jesus Christ's name. Amen and amen. God bless you. God bless you. The grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, the full fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, rest, remain, and abide with us all. God bless you. God bless you. And of course, praise God. Um, somebody is saying that it was a wonderful, wonderful lesson, wonderful teaching. And of course, praise God, I know it's not only the, the one person. There are others who have really been blessed with this wonderful teaching. Amen. So praise God. And as um, I make mention of that, that um, the, the saying goes that the, the cow would have, uh, after eating, there is uh, is our feed they would go and chew up so even before you retire to bed look back on these words god bless you love you all you can greet someone before you bless, bless the lord everyone